history until today can be summarized by this graph. It graphs on the y-axis growth rates and on the x-axis time. History has been a sequence of great eras. Each era has lasted a shorter time but had faster growth and so encompassed a similar amount of total growth. First, animals grew from a half a billion years ago very slowly. Then around two million years ago, humans grew slowly as hunter-gatherers until around 10,000 years ago when farmers grew. And they grew so much faster, they doubled roughly every 1,000 years. And roughly three or 200 years ago, the industrial era began. We've been growing by doubling roughly every 15 years. I'm fascinated by this graph and the trend it shows. And I'm tempted to speculate that there might be another era after ours, another era where growth would be faster. I speculate also that this next era will be based on robots or artificial intelligence. I'm going to spend the rest of this talk trying to describe to you what this new era would be like. I've been warned I should not do this. It's impossible. It's unscientific. Yes, fine, but I'm still doing it. It's fun. And so I will now tell you what this world will be like. Now, some things I could tell you just based on this graph. It will be a bigger world. It can then encompass more kinds of art, more kinds of music stories. It can pay more fixed costs to have more kinds of genres. It will grow faster. Therefore, transportation will be less important compared to local production, things like that. But to say more, I want to focus on the idea that it will be a world dominated by robots, by artificial intelligence. And I can say a number of things just based on that idea all by itself. Robots, first of all, can be immortal. That is, just like houses and cars are today, you, if you keep repairing them, they can last indefinitely. But of course, you don't necessarily keep repairing them. You may toss them and get a new one. Robots can travel by electronically. Instead of physically moving across the globe, you send their bits across a communication line, download them into something at the other end, and then they're there. So it's cheaper to travel long distances. We care about nature both because we like it, but also because we're scared that if we kill nature, we'll die. It's a good fear. Robots will not have that fear. They will know that if they kill nature, they will not die. They may not save nature as much. In general, I'm telling you what I think this world will be like. Some parts are not pretty. Other parts are. I'm not trying to defend it. I'm just trying to describe it. One of the most important things about this world is that robots can make copies easy. Just like we can easily make copies of movies or music, we can make copies of a robot. So you could train one and then make a million copies, each of whom know how to do that task. A whole bunch of things follow from the fact that we can make copies. An important part that follows is growth can be much faster. Let me explain. There is, I'm going to describe four ways we can grow. Our economy today, we have labor and we have capital, and they work together to help us make things. We also have land, but that's not very important in this story. One way to grow is just to make a lot more machines. And we can crank out machines really fast. But the problem is, one person with lots of machines can't do that much more than one person with a couple of machines, because we can only use so many machines at a time. So this way to grow just fails. A better way to grow is to make more people and more machines together but we're slow at that. We can only grow people so fast. So in fact, this isn't the main way we grow today. The main way we grow today is we actually make better machines. We slowly, we don't make better people, unfortunately, but we do make better machines, and that allows us to grow faster. However, an even faster way to grow would be to make robots that substitute for people. And so you can pair a robot with a machine, and then you can crank lots of machines and robots out of the factory as fast as you want. And then you've got an economy that can grow very quickly because you can make both labor and capital grow quickly. That's why a robot economy could grow very quickly. Instead of doubling as our economy does every 15 years, it might double every month or week. That would be very different. Another thing I could say robustly about a world of robots that suddenly grew quickly is that humans would quickly be eclipsed. Perhaps we could stay as, stay as the slave overlords of all, but more likely, 
we would be eclipsed to a margin. Perhaps not as bad as this one guy on the island, but uh, bad. Humans could be like the retirees of our world. Our retirees are not especially productive. We might decide to go kill them and take all their stuff, but we don't, thankfully. And humans might hope to be that way, such that the robots rely on each other by relying on institutions of law and politics that they would th threaten if they tried to kill off all the humans. At least it's a hope. I want to focus in the rest of this talk, however, on a particular scenario of robots, a particular way to make artificial intelligence that's as powerful and general as a human, because that's what we need for this sort of scenario. And for the emulation, it's a way to emulate humans, and I need three things for that. We're going to need a lot of big, powerful, fast computers. We're going to need to take somebody's brain, or many people's, and actually scan it in enormous detail, slice, scan, fine spatial and chemical resolution to see exactly what is where. And then we need to have mathematical computer models of each brain part, each cell, how that part takes input signals, translate that into internal changes and then output signals. And we need to then map the scan detail that we had of the particular brain cells in a particular brain to the details in that model, and then build up a model of an entire brain where we've mapped all those parts of the well, and if we have good enough models of each part, we will have a good enough model of the whole so that the whole has the same input-output behavior. And what that means is you could talk to it. It would talk back. You might ask it to do a job. It might do it for you, just like you do with a person. So because it's an emulation of a person, if it's successful, it emulates all the behavior of a person. It has the same sort of human personality, styles. It laughs, it cries, it falls in love, it argues, etc. So, emulations feel like they are human from their point of view because they remember being a human, they feel like a human, because that's what it means to successfully emulate a human. So they would recognizably be human if you talk to them in terms of their style. But they aren't representative humans. They are different from humans. Why? Because the new emulation economy is going to be very competitive. Because we can make things so fast, because we can make copies so fast, the wages will quickly fall to the cost of making new machines and the new robots, making the brains themselves, and that means wages fall to near what's called a subsistence level, i.e. poor. So it's very competitive, and the people who make emulations will be focused on the few best humans who will be best suited to this world because you can make the most money on them. So instead of taking an average person, as shown by this graph, we might focus on the ones who are the smartest or hardest working and choose them and make billions of copies of them. And the emulation world is a world of billions of copies of the best humans or the best suited humans for this world. So they feel human, they're like humans, but they're different in that way. They're better. There might be only a few hundred humans that dominate these emulations. That is, trillions of emulations might mostly be copies of a few hundred humans, the few hundred best humans. And that means their world would be a social world more like one that we know, or one our ancestors knew better than us, which is our ancestors only ever met 150 people in their entire life. And so they knew them all very well. They knew their personality, what they liked, what they didn't like, what it took to insult them, what it took to make them feel good. And so the world of emulations might be like that. There might be trillions of them, but when you met with George across the table, you'd know George's basis per basic personality, what he liked and what he didn't. There's a billion Georges, but you, base, you know their basic personality. Also, if there's a billion Georges, each George knows there's basically a planet of Georges just like him out there. It's as if he came from that planet and he's here visiting these other people. So all the Georges behind him can like give him advice in his ear. They can compare what worked with millions of other Georges to say what to do in the situation. They, could give, they would have that whole community of identical copies of themselves, what they would organize with. Emulations would differ from us in some ways in terms of their environment. Uh, as indicated by these pictures, most vert emulations in their work job would have office jobs, and typically they would live in a virtual reality that was very pleasant. And Mo even the ones who had a physical job, who needed a physical body to do that, in their leisure time, they would typically be in a virtual reality. And so those virtual realities could be spe spectacularly pretty, uh, uh, comfortable, etc. 
Emulations need never have disease, hunger, cold, sickness, uh, because being an emulation, we might as well make the environment pleasant for them, and it hardly costs anything. That's all on the plus side. On the negative side, you might notice these are all offices. They're working most of the time. They're working a lot. It's a very competitive economy, so they have to spend a lot of their time working so that they can survive. So that means they can, if, when they have a few hours of vacation, they can have the most spectacular, beautiful vacation you've ever thought, but they only get a few hours, and then they have to be back on the clock. That's how emulations would differ. Now, one of the most dramatic differences about this emulation world is the fact that emulations that run on a computer can be run at different speeds. And in fact, we can have electronic circuits that uh, fire 10 million times faster than a human brain cell fires, suggests we can have emulations that run vastly faster than humans or slower. And it also suggests that the cost of running an emulation faster will be about proportional to the speed. So a 16 times faster emulation would cost 16 times as much. So when you assign them to jobs, you'd have to think about, uh, is that worth paying the extra cost to run it faster? So initially, the emulations would be a human speed, because they'd be initially interacting mainly with humans. And it turns out that there's a natural relationship between our mind's reaction time of about a tenth of a second and the fastest frequency that we can move any of our body parts. There's no point in having a mind that reacts faster than we can move our body parts. Uh, if we have an emulation that runs 16 times faster than a human, if it was going to have a physical body that could naturally fit with it, it would need to be 16 times smaller, about the size of the models that would work with the toys this boy is playing with. And 16 times faster means that for them, a whole year would be experienced in the objective 22 days. And we can continue going on up the hierarchy, 256 times faster, they would have to be 16 times smaller still, about the size of these model railroad people. And then they would suffer faster too, and because emulations would naturally want to interact with one another, and if they had different speeds, it would be hard to interact, they would tend to clump into speeds. So instead of just being evenly spread over all possible speeds, they would be in clumps of speeds, and so that would actually make a natural class hierarchy like we see. So they could be 4,000 times faster, 66, you know, a million, 16 million, who knows. But notice about these things, uh, that there's a class hierarchy in the sense that faster emulations will tend to have the features we associate with high class. They will be richer. They will tend to be bosses, as we'll see. They'll be in premium locations. They'll tend to win arguments. They'll know more. It's not just a separation into cultures. It's a ranking into classes. We would assign emulations to tasks according to when it was useful to be fast and when it would be useful to be slow. For example, if you're controlling a physical system, you want to be able to react about as fast as you can control or change that system. So if you're driving a super tanker, you can change it very slow so you don't need to be fast. If you're running a nano factory, maybe you need to be very fast. Um, as we'll see, bosses help them to run faster. Uh, if there might be races sometimes where two teams are trying to be the first to market, in that case they might run as fast as they possibly could, and be the race would be over in an instant even if it spent millions of dollars. It would help to have leisure at a faster speed, because if you're on the job and your clients want to rely on you, at the moment your clients tend to have to suffer when you're off the job at 5 and you have to wait till whole, the 9 in the morning the next day till you're on. But emulations, they could finish a day's work and then be back on the job in a few minutes, and for them it would have been a whole day that they had <laughs> the uh, leisure, but for their clients, they're back on the job in a minute. Uh, it's also true that we can run things very slowly and be cheaper, and so that allows retirement to be cheaper. So when emulations retire, they can retire to a slow, cheap retirement that's uh, very cheap to support. Emulations that are fast or slow live in a very different sort of world. Fast emulations live in a world of mountains and stable rock that hardly ever changes and they can't do anything about, and there's only a small place where they can actually make changes and that things change. But for slow emulations, it's the opposite. They're in a world of buzzing bees and insects all running around doing things that are too fast to track and understand, and they have to find a place where they can see small, slow, stable things. Another physics relation is not just in terms of the size of the body, but in terms of distances. So uh, at the moment, you can talk to anybody across the globe on, say, Skype uh, without necessarily noticing the delay if you have a fast communication line because the speed of light takes less than a tenth of a second to go across the entire Earth. 
But emulations that run are faster, for them, the circle around which they can talk without noticing that somebody is far away gets smaller. So again, for one times human speed, it's fat bigger than the Earth. But for 16 times human speed, about 1,000 kilometers is the circle of which, if they all live in that circle, they won't notice who's how far away. And if we think about a career length of, of 100 years subjectively, then uh, the faster you go, the shorter those career lengths go. So a 16 times faster would have a career over in six years. 256 times faster, they would have roughly a 60 kilometer city that they could be in and not notice the difference. And their career would be over in five months. We can continue on here. Uh, faster, have uh, shorter if they had a body, career length over, and then a tinier distance. So by the time we get to 16 million times faster, they have to be within a meter of each other to not notice the difference, which is really constraining. So when we try to think about the typical speed an emulation would run, it would be a trade-off between running them slow enough so a lot of them can fit inside a city and talk to each other a lot. And on the other hand, if you run them really fast, if you run them too slow, then a career will last longer than the doubling time in the economy, in which case their initial career skills will no longer be very relevant later on at the end of their life. So you might as well run them faster so their career skills last across their career length. And that gives us roughly a speed of 1,000 times human speed as an estimate of what that will be like. Uh, because that speed up is even faster than the growth speed up, to them, they live in a more stable world. Our world is changing very rapidly relative to us, certainly compared to our farmer or forager ancestors. To them, objectively, the world is changing even faster. Subjectively, however, they're in a slower, more stable world. Also, for emulations, they talk to each other and interact with each other through a virtual reality, and they can do that all the way across a city without actually sending their whole brain or body somewhere. They can just do it by sending a few bits that represents their virtual reality interaction. That allows travel and interaction across the city to be very cheap, and it greatly reduces the main limitation we have today on very large city, which is travel congestion costs. That means emulation cities can be bigger, embodying more emulations who can all profitably interact. So there could be, in fact, a few main huge cities that most of the emulations live in, trillions of emulations living in maybe a dozen or less huge cities, perhaps in Scandinavia, as indicated here. I was said I would talk about bosses. Today, organizations are limited by the fact that the top levels of the organization are something of a communication bottleneck. And most of those people at the top spend most of their time taking meetings, trying to coordinate with each other. And that's expensive, and it makes large organizations clumsy and not agile. Emulations, however, we could take, say, the top 21 bosses in this structure I've shown here and make them all the same single boss who runs 21 times faster. Now this guy doesn't have to take so many meetings with himself to coordinate 21 different organizations. He can instead focus on interacting with each subpart. Now, when you have a boss that runs faster than you, then when you meet with the boss, you have to temporarily speed up. So, uh, but that works out OK. And then allows emulation organizations to be larger, better coordinated, and to function uh, better on larger scales. Another issue that comes up in this world, well, I don't have time for another issue. So you'll have to look on the web to see my other talks. <laughs> Take care.